Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege that we have of studying and sharing your word. Thank you for the ways in which you speak to us, and thank you for the honesty that you deal with us on. Heavenly Father, we know that your word is truth, your word is life, and your word gives hope. Father, may all of those things rumble around in our souls and hearts as we study your word this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now, both in worship and in ABC, we are in this series. It is called Game Day. And uh, this series we're doing because it is football season. And as you well know, uh, all season long, football players will run drills and look at tape and lift weights and practice hard so that they can be prepared for a day in football that matters more than any other day. It is Game Day. Because when game day comes, football players, they want to be prepared. They want to be ready to win. They want to be ready to play well. They want to be ready to leave it all out on the field. Football players, for them, the biggest day is game day. Now, in this series, we're talking about just like football players have a game day, Christians have a game day too. But our game day doesn't just come along once a week, Friday for high school, Saturday for college, Sunday for NFL. Our game day comes each and every day. Because for the Christian, every single day is a day that we are called to live faithfully. Every single day is a day that we are called to love generously. Every single day is a day that we are called to shine God's light of truth into a world that is darkened by sin. For the Christian, every single day is a day that matters because every single day is a day that God has given, which makes every single day for us game day. And so the question that we're asking in this series is just this. If every day is game day when you're a Christian, If every day matters when you're a Christian, how do you train for that? How do you prepare and get ready to live your life like every day counts, like every day matters, like every day is game day? Now, traditionally, the church and Christians have answered this question of living life well, living life like every day is game day. They've answered this question with something called spiritual disciplines. And I've given you this working definition of what a spiritual discipline is. A spiritual discipline is an everyday practice that helps you grow in your faith and live your life well. This is how you prepare for game day. You engage in these spiritual disciplines. And we've been learning in this series that lots of different things can be spiritual disciplines. Because lots of different things can help us grow in our faith. And lots of different things can help us live our lives well. For example, last weekend we talked about the spiritual discipline of Sabbath. And Sabbath can help us grow in our faith because Sabbath is a day of worship. And when we worship, we take the time to stop, to focus on God, to hear his word, to sing praises to his name. All of that stuff helps us grow in our faith. Sabbath also helps us live our lives well because the Sabbath day is also a day of rest and that is something that we need just to keep on keeping on. These are spiritual disciplines, things that help you grow in your faith and live your life well. Today as we continue, we're going to be talking about the spiritual discipline of silence. You know, probably my favorite morning of the week is Saturday morning because that is the morning for me that is the most silence. That is the morning for me that is full of lots of peace and quiet. I get up early, I make myself a pot of coffee, and I sit on the couch, and I just relax for a few minutes before everybody else gets up. Normally, my week is filled with emails to tend to, phone calls to return, meetings to have, crises to manage, but Saturday morning, that is a morning for me of silence. And you know what? In my life, a little bit of silence is always needed and nice. Another one of my favorite times of the week, when I go for a run real early in the morning. I get up before anybody else gets up, and I just hit the road, do a short run, three miles. But those three miles are three miles that are precious to me because they are full of silence. In fact, I've noticed something about my runs. Usually when I am running, that is where my best ideas come. 
Sometimes I'll dream up a sermon series in the back of my head, or sometimes I'll think about different ministry initiatives in the back of my head, and I'll talk to Pastor Tucker, and I'll share with him some of my ideas, and if I had an idea during one of my runs, I will actually tell him, Pastor, this is a run idea. And so he listens, because those are like the only good ideas I have. Now, now, there's actually a scientific reason for this. Scientists have done studies on this kind of thing. The reason that your best ideas come when you're doing something like running or good ideas come for some people when they're in the shower is because of the silence that is around them. They're not doing something that takes a whole lot of thought. They're not doing something that distracts their mind in a million different ways into a million different places. And so their brain is able to kind of play a game of no holds barred free association where they can take one idea and connect it to another idea and all of a sudden you get a new idea. Silence helps you think and think well. Silence can be inspiring. This is why silence is needed and nice. Silence is something that all of us need. There was a preacher in the 1800s in Great Britain. His name is Charles Spurgeon. He had a congregation in London of 10,000 people. Over the course of his ministry, preached to over 10 million people. Charles Spurgeon was not a guy who knew a lot of silence in his life, and yet he knew that silence, even with his busy schedule, was something that he needed. He actually wrote this about silence. He said, Time spent in quiet prostration of the soul before the Lord is most invigorating. Quietude, which some men cannot abide because it reveals their inner poverty, is a palace of cedar to the wise. For along its hallowed courts, the king in his beauty designs to walk. Priceless as the gift of utterance may be, the practice of silence in some aspects far excels it. Quiet contemplation, still worship, unuttered rapture. These are mine when my best jewels are before me. Brethren, he says, rob not your heart of the deep sea joys. Miss not the far down life by forever babbling. Charles Spurgeon said, there's a time, there's a place, there's a moment for silence. And if you spend your whole life forever babbling, you're going to miss the joy of silence. The authors of Scripture knew that we as people need silence. One of my favorite promises in the Bible, Psalm 23, verse 2. This is the psalm about the good shepherd. And the good shepherd, the Lord who is our shepherd, makes us lie down in green pastures and he leads us beside what kind of waters? Quiet. Quiet waters. Because we are people who need silence. Isaiah 32, verse 17, the fruit of righteousness is going to be peace. The effect of righteousness is going to be silence and confidence forever. Lamentations 3, verse 26, it is good to wait silently for the salvation of the Lord. Even Jesus, he invites his disciples in Mark 6, verse 31, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place, a silent place, and get a little bit of rest. Silence is something that we need. Now, it's all of this that takes us to our story for today. Because today, we're going to be taking a look at the story of a man who needed a little bit of peace, a little bit of quiet, a little bit of silence badly. His name was Job. And before we get to the story of Job, I want to begin by giving you a little bit of background on the book of Job. Job is actually the oldest book that we have in our Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those were written by Moses when the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness. Uh, the book of Job actually goes back to the days of Abraham. That's when most scholars think it was written. And here's the reason that I appreciate that so much when it comes to the book of Job. If you know the story of Job, then you generally know that the story of Job has something to do with pain and suffering it has lots to do with tragedy and hurt and heartache. It has lots to do with questions about why bad things happen in this world and in this life. Anybody in here ever had questions like that? Raise your hand. Just time a mass confession here. Okay, here's the reason that I love the book of Job. The book of Job reminds us, because it's the oldest book in the Bible, that people have been struggling with those kinds of questions for a very long time. The oldest book in the Bible is about these kinds of questions. 
And so we're going to be taking a look at the book of Job, the story of Job. We're going to start at the very beginning of the book, Job 1 verse 1. If you've got a Bible out of the back of the room, you're going to find it on page 359. Page 359. Job 1 verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Pause right there. Story begins with this guy who lived in the land of Uz. We don't know where Uz was. It was kind of a land that was far away. Some scholars think it was an Edomite territory. We know that it was not an Israelite territory. And so here is this guy whose name is Job, and Job is a super duper good guy. Job 1 verse 1 says, Job was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. I want you to pick up on this word blameless. In Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, the word for blameless is the word tom. Now, what's interesting about this word tom is that the word tom pops up in places like Psalm 19 verse 7. The law of the Lord, the psalmist says, is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord, the psalmist says, are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The Hebrew word for perfect in Psalm 19 verse 7 is this word tom. And so this kind of gives you a clue, an idea as to how good Job actually was. Job was not just any old kind of good. Job was tom good. To use the words of Mary Poppins, Job was practically perfect in every way. This is Job's righteousness. This is Job's holiness. This is Job's nobility. In fact, here's how good he was. Job 1 verse 2 now. Job had seven sons and three daughters. Pause again. I want you to notice the numbers here of the kids that Job has. A lot of times in the Bible, numbers kind of give you a little bit of symbolic significance. And so Job has seven sons. In the Bible, the number seven is a number of wholeness and perfection. That's why how many days do we have in a week? We have seven. It's a number of completion. And then he has three daughters. Again, in the Bible, three is another number of wholeness and perfection. That's why there is one God, yet in the Trinity, we are reminded that he is how many persons? He is three. And God is perfect. He is whole. And so here's the idea. Not only is Job a perfect and whole man, like practically perfect in every way, he's like a good guy with like a perfect and whole family. He even has perfect numbers of kids. Seven sons and three daughters. Verse three, Job also owned 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and had a large number of servants He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Here's how good Job was. A lot of times his kids would throw these little parties. They would feast, they would eat, they would drink, and Job would get concerned that maybe, just maybe, his kids had sinned. And so he would say to himself, verse 5, perhaps my children have sinned and curse God in their hearts. Now I want you to pick up on this word, perhaps, because does the verse actually say that Job's kids had sinned and cursed God in their hearts? No. Job just says, perhaps they have. This is a possibility. It could have happened. Doesn't mean that it did happen, but just in case, Job says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to offer a sacrifice on their behalf. I'm going to worship God on their behalf. Even if they didn't do anything wrong, just in case something wrong did happen, let's just take care of it right now and offer a sacrifice because this is how noble and pious Job was. There didn't even have to be a sin for Job to be concerned that maybe possibly there was a sin. Job was a really good guy. Story continues, Job 1 verse 6. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth who is like him. 
He is blameless. He is upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But if you stretch out your hand and strike everything that he has, Satan says, he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. Everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. A couple of things here that I want you to notice about this section of Job's story. First thing that I want you to notice is that Satan is on the move. God says to Satan, verse 7, where have you come from? And Satan answers, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Now, don't you think that's kind of an elusive and evasive answer? I mean, imagine if your spouse comes home at 3 o'clock in the morning and you are wondering where in the world they have been. And so you say, where have you been? And they say, oh, I've just been out roaming the earth and going back and forth in it. Do you think you'd want a little bit more information than that? Because if all they say is out, then you know that they have been up to no good. Otherwise, they would tell you exactly what they were doing. And Satan's answer betrays what he's been up to. Because if he was up to something good, if he was up to something fine, he would tell God exactly what he's been doing. But he essentially says to God, oh, I've been out, just out, roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. And so Satan is up to no good. That's the first thing that I want you to notice. Second thing that I want you to notice about this section of Job's story is that in order to read the book of Job properly, it's helpful to kind of see the book of Job as taking place on two stages. There is a lower stage, that's the earth, and then there's the upper stage, that is in heaven. Now, Pastor talked about this in his message. Here's one of the really interesting things about the book of Job. In the book of Job, we, as its readers, actually get a peek into what's going on in the upper stage. We can see God, we can see Satan. We can see the angels. We know that Satan has leveled an accusation against Job, saying, hey, the only reason that Job serves you, God is because you have blessed him. We'll get back to that accusation in a second. But we know what's going on in heaven. Satan knows what's going on in heaven. God knows what's going on in heaven. Who's the one person in this book who doesn't know what's going on in heaven? Job. And that's the reality of our lives. Because just like Job cannot see what's going on on the upper stage, we cannot see what is going on on the upper stage. And that's what makes Job's struggle so incredibly hard. Now, back to Satan's accusation. Satan's accusation is this. Does Job, verse 9, fear God for nothing? Satan is saying to God, hey, God, Job serves you. Job loves you. Job follows you. Job worships you. But he doesn't do all of that for nothing. You've hooked him up, Satan says to God. You've blessed him in extravagant ways. You've put a hedge around him. That's the reason that he is so devoted to you. But really, God, the only reason that Job is so devoted to you is because you have been really good to him. Job loves you kind of like children love an ice cream truck. Okay? Job loves you kind of like the way a politician loves a donor. It's kind of a tit-for-tat kind of love. You scratch his back by blessing him, and he scratches yours by worshiping you. But if you turn off the faucet of blessing, God, just watch how quickly Job is going to turn off the faucet of devotion. He's going to curse you to your face. There's no such thing, Satan says, as a self-giving, selfless, sacrificial covenant of love between God and humans. It's all a farce. It's all tit for tat. It's all quid pro quo. You don't really love him, and he doesn't really love you. You guys are just in it for what's in it. That's the accusation that Satan is making against Job here. Now, of course, God doesn't agree with Satan. God thinks that Satan is wrong. And so God says to Satan, all right, you can take your best shot. But you're wrong about Job. He doesn't just love me because of what I give to him. In fact, you're wrong about humanity. They don't just love me because of what I give to them. So take your best shot. 
In fact, it's kind of interesting. In verses 11 and 12, Satan says to God, if you stretch out your hand and you strike everything that Job has, he's surely going to curse you to your face. And the Lord responds by saying to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Here's the reason that I love this so much. We kind of get a couple of dueling pronouns here. Satan says to God, here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to strike everything that Job has. Totally decimate and destroy Job. You know what God says? You do it. I'm not going to do it. You do it. You can have everything he has. But on the man himself, you cannot lay a finger. Satan's request is that God strike down Job. God says, no, I'll let you strike down Job. Now it's here that we at least get kind of a partial answer to why bad things happen to good people. And here's the reason why. Let me give you the one word answer, Satan. Let me give you another word answer, sin. Let me give you another word answer, depravity. But let me give you what the answer is not, God. It's just kind of a general reminder. Every sickness, every pain, every hurt, every disaster, every disorder, that isn't a result of God. That's a result of sin. That's a plot and a ploy of Satan. And as the story continues, we're going to see the kind of havoc that Satan can wreak in Job's life. Job 1 verse 13. Here's what Satan does to Job. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and your daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. In the scope of seven verses, here's what Job loses. His oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his servants, his camels, his sons, and his daughters. This was not in the scope of a day. This this was in the scope of seven verses. This was not in the scope of several hours. This was in the scope of a few minutes. While he gets one piece of bad news, immediately another piece of bad news comes along. Anybody want to sign up to have a day like that? I mean, this is like the worst day, save the day that Jesus had on the cross. This is like the worst day in the history of humanity. Now, it's here that we actually get our first really big example of silence in the book of Job. Because at the same times that his servants are talking to him and giving him all of this bad news, you know who seems strangely silent to Job? God does. Job has to be wondering what in the world is going on here. I had everything, and now in the scope of just a few minutes, I have nothing. God has always blessed me. Why has he stopped? God has always spoken to me. Why is he not saying a thing? God has always helped me. Why now do I feel so cursed? God seems strangely silent. Job says later in the book, Job 30 verse 20, I cry out to you, O God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. That's Job's heart. God seems silent. You know, I have learned that when it comes to silence from God, there are usually two things that bother us when God is silent. The first thing that bothers us is that God doesn't explain his silence to us. We want an answer and all of heaven seems to go quiet. But the other thing that bothers us about the silence of God is that we can't 
help it. We can't make God speak, and we can't make whatever is wrong better. Last summer, my little girl, Hope, she broke her arm. She was sitting in one of those high back chairs. We have them in our kitchenette, and all of a sudden, she was out of the chair, onto the floor, and she was crying, and immediately, my wife knew that something was wrong. And so she calls me, and we wind up at urgent care, and they do an x-ray, and she has this broken arm, so we take her to a doctor. The good news is, even in a cast, she manages to look kind of happy and cute and sweet. It's all healed. She's all good to go. But I was thinking about that moment in time, because that moment in time was a moment that actually had quite a bit of fear for us. This was our first broken bone. We have a feeling it won't be our last, but it was our first. We were worried because she wouldn't stop crying and we knew that she was in pain. But as I was thinking about that moment, I never asked certain questions. I never asked, oh God, why is this happening to me? Oh God, why are you silent? Oh God, why don't you help? You know why I never asked those questions? Because I knew that this was not good, but we could fix it. We could help it. All we had to do was take her to the doctor, get a cast put on, and she would be as good as new. So I never ask questions about the silence of God. Here's what I've learned about the silence of God. We only ask questions about the silence of God when there are things that we cannot fix by ourselves. Isn't it a funny thing? We never ask questions about the silence of God when everything is okay or even when everything is not okay and we can still fix it by ourselves. But when we cannot fix it by ourselves, all of a sudden then we wonder, oh God, why are you so silent? You know, sometimes we actually prefer that God is silent so that we can be in control, so that we can take control. We don't always want to hear what God has to say about stewarding our money wisely. We don't always want to hear what God has to say about managing our sexuality faithfully. We don't always want to hear what God says about using our words carefully. But I'll tell you what, when something bad happens that we can't control, maybe it's a diagnosis, cancer, ALS. Maybe it's a tragedy, your house gets washed away. Maybe it's something that you cannot control, you cannot help, and you cannot fix. And all of a sudden, we want to know, oh God, why are you so silent? You know, what if God's silence, or seeming silence, at these times, is really an invitation to listen to him at all times? Even when we are in times when everything is fine and everything is under our control. You know, that's the spot that Job is in. He can't fix this. He can't control this. He doesn't understand this. The only thing that Job can do is trust God through this. And so back up in heaven, Job 2, verse 2, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth. And it Satan's up to no good. We know the no good he's been up to this time. He's taken everything Job has. The Lord said to Satan, verse 3, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless. He's upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin, without any reason. I want you to pick up on this phrase from the end of verse 3. God says to Satan, you incited me against Job to ruin him without any reason. Uh, the Hebrew word for this phrase, without any reason, is the word kanan. This is the same word that Satan uses in chapter 1, verse 9, when Satan accuses Job by saying, does Job fear God for nothing? Hebrew word there for nothing is the word kanan. And so here's basically what God is saying to Satan. Hey, Satan, you hate Job for nothing. You hate Job without any good reason. You hate Job, cannot. You hate him just because. Last Monday was kind of a rough night. Melody was out for a meeting, and so I was on daddy duty with Hope. And Hope was just not having a very good evening. 
Uh, she was having spaghetti for supper. She didn't want to wear a bib. That was not good. Every single time I would come to the table, you know what she would say to me? She'd say, go away, Daddy. And then she'd cry and cry and cry. This went on for like over an hour. Dinner took over an hour. Finally, I sit down at the table with Hope, and I say to Hope, Hope, do you know why you are so upset? And she has these big crocodile tears, and she's sobbing, and she says, <laughs> no. She had no clue why she was upset. She had no clue why she was upset with me. She was just probably tired and having kind of a bad evening. She was mad, really, canon. She was upset for no reason at all. Now, this happens not only with like two and a half year olds, this happens with grown-ups too, right? I don't know how many couples I've had in my office who are going through troubles. And it seems as though they fight so often they actually forget what they're fighting about. They're angry at each other so much they forget what they are angry about. It just kind of feels good to fight. And it just kind of feels good to be angry. That's what Satan is doing to Job. It just kind of feels good to wreck and to ruin him. And so he wrecks and ruins him Canaan with no good reason at all. But here's the really interesting thing about the word Canaan. You know what this is a cognate of in Hebrew? This is a cognate of the word for grace. Because grace is also something that happens canon. It happens for no good reason at all. Here's Satan. Satan hates Job canon for no good reason at all. But then there's God. And God loves Job canon. For no good reason at all, just because he's God, just because he's good, just because he's gracious, just because, just because he's God. You see, Canaan can be used for good. It can be used for love and help and service. It can also be used for bad. It can be used for hatred and bitterness and resentment. Which way do you use Canaan? You know, Satan is so mad at Job that when God says to Satan, hey, you hate him, Canaan. Job wants to take, I mean, Satan wants to take another run at Job. Satan says, uh, Job 2 verse 4, skin for skin. A man is going to give all that he has for his own life. But if you stretch out your hand and you strike his flesh and bones, he will surely curse you to your face. Satan says to God, you know, God, the only reason that Job hasn't gotten upset with you, the only reason that Job has not cursed you is because you have not hurt him, at least not directly. You have not made him sick. You have not made him infirm. You have not taken away his health. Skin for skin, Satan says. If you hurt him, if you strike him, he's going to get mad at you. He's going to curse you to your face. And so Job 2, verse 6, the Lord said to Satan, very well then. He's in your hands. Again, God is not going to do this to Job. Satan will. He's in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. You know, by this point in the story, Job has pretty much gone as low as you can go without just flat out dying. Satan afflicts him with sores that are so bad that he can't even scratch them with his fingernails. He has to break a piece of pottery and use the shards because those are the only things that are sharp enough to scratch his wounds. There's only one of his family members who's still alive. You know who that is? His wife. Now, in this particular instance, Mrs. Job is not a lot of help. You know what she says to her husband? Job 2, verse 9. Curse God and die. That's not exactly Norman Vincent Peale power of positive thinking stuff, right? I mean, that's not really encouraging. Seems like Job doesn't have anything left. But here's the great thing about the book of Job. Job, when he doesn't have anything left, you know what he does have? He has some friends. And his friends come to visit him in his misery. Job 2, verse 11. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, heard all about the troubles that had come upon Job, they set out from their homes. 
And they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. So they began to weep aloud. They tore their robes. They sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with Job for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Job has these three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, Dadgum the Termite. I don't think that fourth one is in there, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> he has these friends. And these friends come to try to comfort Job in his suffering, and they do four things, and they're all important. I want you to notice the four things they do. Verse 12, the first thing they do, when they see him from a distance, they can hardly recognize him, and so they begin to weep aloud. Now, here's the reason that's poignant and important. If you notice, if you read through the book of Job, you know how many times Job cries? Zero. He never sheds a tear. Even though he loses everything, his kids, his health, his cattle, his home, he never cries. It's almost like he's in such utter shock that everything has happened so hard and so fast that he didn't even know how to respond. Job's friends, however, they weep aloud because they see how bad things are. Second thing that I want you to notice about what Job's friends do, they tear their robes, according to verse 12. Now, in the Bible, tearing your robe is a sign of intense emotion. There's a story about a king of Israel. His name is Josiah. And Josiah finds something called the book of the law. It's the law of God. It had been lost in Israel for centuries. Josiah has one of his scribes read it to him. And 2 Kings 22 verse 11 says, When King Josiah heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Because as soon as he heard these words, he knew that Israel was not following these words. And he was the king of Israel, and he wanted to get Israel back on the right track. And so he is so intensely emotional about hearing God's word and hearing hearing how Israel is in defiance of God's word, that he tears his robes. In the trial of Jesus, Matthew 26, Jesus is before the religious leaders, and Jesus says to them, in the future, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. You know how the high priest responds to what Jesus has says? Matthew 26, verse 65, the high priest tore his robe, and he said, he's spoken blasphemy. This is how intensely emotional the high priest was toward Jesus. This is how intensely bitter the high priest was toward Jesus. Job's friends, they see Job and, and they're overcome with emotion. And so they tear their robes. Third thing that I want you to notice, then after they tear their robes, they sprinkle dust on their heads. You probably know the verse, Genesis 3, verse 19, after sin comes into the world, God issues a curse. Genesis 3, verse 19, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Job's friends, they're calling to mind that curse when they sprinkle dust on their own heads, and they think, wow, this man must be cursed. And then finally, the fourth thing that I want you to notice, verse 13, for seven days and seven nights, no one said a word to Job because they saw how great his suffering was. That's the fourth thing I want you to notice. I want you to notice how Job's friends are silent. You know, sometimes the best thing that you can do in the face of great suffering is to do exactly what Job's friends did. It is simply to be silent. You know, I have a pastor buddy of mine. He was going to go on a spiritual retreat into the woods, spend like 10 days, just he and God, nobody else around. And we were having a phone conversation before he went on that retreat. And he admitted to me, you know, I'm a little nervous about this because I'm an extrovert. I like lots of people around. And just me and God, that sounds good, but it also is a little bit unnerving. You know why? Because he loves a lot of clamor in his life. He kind of has a problem with silence. One of the things that I'll do in the middle of the day is I'll go home for lunch. 
helps me uh, take care of a couple of errands. Sometimes I'll fold laundry. Sometimes I'll pull the trash out. Sometimes I'll get some meals prepared. But it's funny, when I do that, I always turn on the TV in the background, listen to some news. That way, if a story catches my attention, I can go in there and check it out. But when I don't turn on the TV, I automatically start thinking to myself, golly, it's like really quiet in here. And so I'll go and I'll turn on the TV just so I have a little bit of background noise. Why? Because I too can a lot of times have a problem with silence. And yet, in the words of the song, silence really can be golden. Silence really is important. And so here's what I want to do as we wrap up today. I want to give you five reasons for silence. Silence. Five reasons that silence really can be golden. Five reasons that silence really should be a part of your life. Reason number one is this. Silence can help you help. Silence can help you help. Here's what I mean by this. Sometimes the best way to help somebody who's going through a tough time like Job was going through a tough time is just to be silent. Theologians will often talk about something called the ministry of presence. And the ministry of presence is very simply this. Sometimes the best way to help somebody is not with a word, not with a nugget of wisdom, not with a lecture or a speech or a sermon. Sometimes the best way to help somebody, the best way to minister to them is just to be with them. You know, Jesus makes us this glorious promise, Matthew 28, verse 20. After he gives the Great Commission, you know what he promises? The ministry of presence, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. You know, Job's friends, they were great when they practiced the ministry of presence, but as soon as they opened their mouths after seven days and seven nights, eh, things began to go downhill from there. Job's friend Eliphaz, he starts talking, Job 4, verse 7, and he says to Job, consider now who being innocent has ever perished. Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. Here's what Eliphaz is essentially saying to Job. Hey, Job, if you are innocent, you do not perish. And if you are upright, you are not destroyed. Therefore, since you are being destroyed, since you are on the precipice of perishing, there must be something wrong with you. You must have done something bad. You must have done something evil. You must have done something sinful. And so fess up. Tell us what it is, Job. Lay it on us. We can handle us. Confess your sin. Here's the problem. The very beginning of the book reminds us that this isn't happening because Job sinned. Job was a man who was blameless and upright. He feared God. He loved evil. This has nothing to do with Job and everything to do with Satan. Eliphaz opens his mouth and he gets it dead wrong. I love what Job finally says to his friends after they babble on for a while. Job 13, verse 5, he says, If only you would all together be silent. For you, that would be wisdom. Amen. They were great as long as they shut up. As soon as they say something, they mess it all up. Sometimes the best way you can help someone is just to be with someone. Silence can help you help somebody else. That's the first reason you ought to spend some time being silent. Second reason you ought to spend some time being silent. Silence can help you hear. Silence can help you hear. Specifically, silence can help you hear from God. I want to show you a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer says this, silence is the simple stillness of the individual under the word of God. We're silent before hearing the word because our thoughts are already directed to the word as a child is quiet when he enters his father's room. We're silent after hearing the word because the word is still speaking and dwelling within us. We're silent at the beginning of the day because God should have the first word and we're silent before going to sleep because God should also have the last word. We keep silence solely for the sake of the word and therefore not in order to show disregard for the word but rather to honor and to receive the word. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, here's the best way that you can honor the word of God. In fact, here's the best way that you can hear the word of God. Just listen to it. 
be silence in the face of the word of God. Habakkuk 2 verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Sometimes that's what we need to be before God because when we are that, we can hear God in a profound way, in an amazing way. You want to hear from God? Here's a great spiritual discipline for you, the spiritual discipline of silence because silence helps you hear. Third thing that silence is good for. Silence can help you focus. Silence can help you focus. I gotta tell you, my wife is an amazing woman. In the evening, I will watch her and she will be watching a TV show. She'll be working on a puzzle book like Crosswords or Sudoku or something like that. She'll also be texting on her phone and playing a game of words with friends on her iPad all at the same time. Every once in a while, I'll come out there and I'll sit with her on the couch and I'll bring a little bit of work to do, try to get some work done while the TV's going and she's doing three other things. And it's an amazing thing because when I do that, you know what happens? All of a sudden, I stop working and I start watching the TV. Because if it's not quiet, if it's not silent, I get distracted very, very, very easily. Anybody else have the same problem as me or is it just me? This is one of the beauties of silence. Just very practically, it can help you focus, not just on your work, but on what matters most. There is a reason that all the really good ideas come in the shower, on a run, when things are silent, because it just helps you focus, helps you zoom in on the real important stuff of life. So is there some real important stuff you gotta think through? Is there some real important stuff you gotta tend to? Here's a great reason that you should practice the spiritual discipline of silence. Fourth reason that silence is good. Silence can help you rest. Silence can help you rest. You know, my wife, I'm guessing it's because she teaches a classroom full of first graders. She is really good at focusing even when a lot of things are going on. You know what she's not very good at? Resting when things are not silent. She wants it dark, she wants it quiet, she wants everything perfectly peaceful. I, however, do not have that kind of problem. Let me show you this. That's my wife, that's me, that's the AT&T Center during the rodeo. <laughs> my friend was so gracious and snapped a picture of me catching a little nap. Um, doesn't really matter where it is, doesn't matter how noisy it is, I can sleep anywhere, any place, any time. My wife, however, has a little bit more trouble. But, but here's the thing, even if you can't do this, and even if you can, you still need silence to rest. There was an interesting study that came out last year from Penn State University. They took a couple of dozen adults and they gave them iPads and they told them to play around on the iPads for a couple hours each night before they went to bed. What the researchers found was that the participants who played around on the iPads, they displayed reduced levels of melatonin. You know that hormone that kind of increases that evening feeling of sleepiness? They took longer to fall asleep. They spent less time in restorative sleep. And they also were really tired the next morning, even if they slept for eight hours. Why? Because before they went to bed, they filled their heads and hearts with noise. Not audible noise, just like electronic noise from the iPad. How much noise is your life filled with? How restless not only does your body but your soul feel? If you're in a moment of stress, if you're under a moment of duress, if you need some rest, one of the best things you can do is just to step back and take a little bit of silence. Because silence can help you rest. Fifth thing that silence is really good for Silence is good for love. Silence is good for love. You know what I like best about the book of Job? You remember Satan's question at the very beginning? His accusation against Job, Job 1 verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? That's actually the question of this book. Is it just that Job serves God because God has blessed Job? Is it just that Job loves God because God is hooking up Job? 
Is there such a thing as a self-giving, sacrificial, selfless love that loves not on the basis of what has been given to you, but loves simply on the basis of love? You see, Satan thinks that everything is tit for tat. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And as soon as God cuts off the blessings, Job is going to cut off the devotions. But here's what I love about this. After Job loses everything, his animals, his property, his kids, Job 1 verse 21 Job says this, The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job loses it all. And you know what Job still does? Job still worships. Job is taken. He has everything taken from him. And you know what Job still does? Job still loves And this is the really good news of the book of Job because there is this bet between God and Satan going on in heaven that Job can't see, but we can't see. And the bet is this. Is there such a thing as a selfless, sacrificial, self-giving love? Is there such a thing as a love that is given not because of what it gets, but simply because it's love? Satan says no. God says yes. And you know who wins the bets? God does, which means that Satan loses. And that's the really good news of the book of Job. The really good news of the book of Job is that Satan loses. God has proved right. There is such a thing as a devotion and a love and a faithfulness that is not just quid pro quo. That is not just, well, I'll scratch your back because I want you to scratch mine. That is not tit for tat. This love is expressed in a small way in Job's devotion to God. It's expressed in an ultimate way when God makes a move one day from the upper stage to the lower stage. Comes in a person named Jesus who dies for us. Not because of anything that we have done, but simply because he loves us and he wants to save us. You know, there's this episode in Jesus' crucifixion when there are these witnesses and they're bringing false testimonies against Jesus. And the high priest stands up before Jesus and he asks Jesus, Mark 14, verse 60, are are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? And you know what Jesus does according to Mark 14, verse 61? Jesus remains silent. Why? Because he's on a mission of love. He's not going to respond. He's not going to react. He's not going to retaliate. And that silence says so much about Jesus' love for you. Says so much about Jesus' love for me. And that silence is wrapped up deep love, deep love from God to us. You know, silence can help you love, too. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still, be silent, and know that I am God. You know, my prayer for you is that you take that verse to heart this week and you practice silence. Because silence isn't just golden. It's divine. It's a blessing, and it is needed. So receive it with joy. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, We know that this world can be a tough and a rough place. And sometimes the best way to address the struggles that we face, the trials that we endure, is just with a little bit of peace and quiet. Just with a little bit of silence. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your son had a love for us that was so great that even when people were accusing him, he didn't defend himself. He was was instead silent. He was silent for us. He was silent because he loved us. And his silence ultimately leads to our salvation. Heavenly Father, may we practice silence in our life. 
so that we can focus on you and hear from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, guys. Walk with the light.